rather intimate night. Um, it's fabulous to have people here, and it's also fabulous, and we're so lucky to have Jeff Harriet amongst us, both as a speaker, but also as our AIIA secretary. Um, I have to say this book, which is going to be on the screen to me, um, is pretty amazing. You can order it through Fuller's, but um, it is quite expensive and quite weighty too. So uh, don't go to sleep with it on your face because it might knock you out. Um, but it might knock you out in terms of the information that Jeff's been able to put together in his um, amazing career um, that spans journalism, management of, um, of radio and radio internationally, um, international affairs, um, and then moving at a not so young age into a PhD, which I think is enormously brave, um, where you've been writing in a particular way as a journalist, and then you move to have to write in a totally different way as an academic. Um, and I think that Jeff's done that to him. So this book is based on his thesis for which he got his PhD, and it's a great read. Um, I, told you, I should have said, I'm Kim Boyer, and I'm the um, state president of AIIA. And in um, starting tonight, I should also, work, um, also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, um, the Pala people. Um, and they've been the custodians of this land for a long, long time. And this land is still um, subject to treaty, subject to, uh, and has never been ceded. It's really important that we understand that we have a tentative right to this land rather than a real one. Um, okay, away from those politics, because we're going to have those at one of our later sessions um, this year on um, Indigenous um, responsibilities in other jurisdictions across the world. Um, but welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you. Thank you so much for your generosity in giving this talk. And um, I look forward to, to it. Jeff will talk, then we'll be having the usual Q&A. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kim, and thank you all for coming. It's uh, not, not, the, uh, not the most pleasant night to be venturing out, so I'm grateful for your time and your attention. Um, I'd like to also make a couple of acknowledgements too, given that we're here talking about international broadcasting. Um, with us tonight is uh, former colleague, Elaine Chung, who had a very distinguished career both at Radio Australia and prior to that as the ABC correspondent in Beijing. In fact, the, um, the first ABC staff foreign correspondent of her gender, which was uh, another breakthrough. And I'd also like to acknowledge another veteran of Radio Australia and international broadcasting, Rosemary Darrow, who's uh, a veteran of much else besides. Thank you. She's been uh, great support throughout the PhD and subsequent publication process. The ABC, as a national broadcaster, actually, by statute, has a dual purpose. We all know the ABC as part of Australia's cultural infrastructure, but insofar it's also, as it's also responsible for broadcasting to foreign publics, it can be said to be part of Australia's sovereign infrastructure as well. It's, um, it is an instrument of foreign policy, small f, small p, and the purpose of its international services are to assist in building a virtual enlargement of the Australian state. And, and that is of uh, critical importance Time. You might notice, by the way, that James and I are trying to remember how to do, uh, to do semaphore. <laughs> the university has outsmarted us by changing the technology at the console. So I actually can't operate the slides and I'm relying on James' impeccable sense of timing to do so on our collective behalf. Now, 
These are uh, two quotes from two former <coughs> national presidents of the Institute of International Affairs. I don't propose reciting for you the, the nature of the many sources of instability, insecurity, volatility affecting us globally and throughout the Indo-Pacific. But I think it's these two, these two um, extracts convey two very important messages. One is we're in uncharted territory. And the second is that for a country like Australia, which is still, although a developing Eurasian identity, is still very much rooted in, in the West. And unlike many other countries, say in Europe, as John McCarthy has pointed out, we face a regional neighbourhood of some 40 nations across the Indo-Pacific who are in the main unlike us in almost every respect, demographically, ethnically, ideologically, religiously, we can go on. So the task we have in, um, in communicating to foreign audiences or foreign publics in a way that projects an Australian narrative and projects a sense of, of uh, le legitimacy and influence on behalf of this country, we do so across many different cultural frontiers. Now, once upon a time, the radio version of Australia's International Broadcasting Services used to rate alongside uh, the giants of international broadcasting, including the BBC and Voice of America within Southeast Asia and the Pacific in terms of its audience reach, its influence and the power of its communication. However, in um, over recent decades, Australian governments have serially invested and disinvested um, in international broadcasting services. Along the way, they've squandered treasure, they've breached faith with audiences, and they have, each time the cycle has turned, in order to restore some commitment to international broadcasting, so one has to rebuild credibility, real rebuild trust. Um, now, we're going through at the moment something of a modest resurgence. The, the Labor government has committed itself to what it calls an Indo-Pacific broadcasting strategy. It's a strategy born out of fear because of China's assertiveness, especially in the Pacific. And suddenly, um, and indeed, even before Labor came to power, uh, the Morrison government was uh, again rediscovering the relevance of media in the region at a time when uh, Chinese broadcasters, uh, print publications and influences were appearing everywhere in the Pacific. So the current Labor government has, has taken a somewhat different approach to the former coalition governments, which tended to focus very much on sort of hard power solutions to insecurity, very much focused on military and economic um, and alliance um, uh, strategies, and were much less interested in things like foreign aid and, and certainly international broadcasting. Um, Labor under Foreign Minister Penny Wong talks about the need to use all the tools of statecraft to project Australian interests, build relationships, create trust and credibility throughout the region. And uh, anyone who's interested, it's worth looking at the statements recently made by the government about the sorts of initiatives they're taking in the Pacific, because you will see that they've made a, a fairly reasonable fist of drawing together hard power, um, economic options and sort of softer initiatives to try to uh, make a, a, an integrated approach to both regional development and representing Australia's interests in the region. Um, 
And mostly what they're doing is focusing on the Pacific, although they're talking as a government on also taking some initiatives in Southeast Asia and South Asia. But in the, in the Pacific, and the, the rhetoric is all about the so-called Pacific family and Australia's ostensible membership of that Pacific family. So the funding um, that they've been providing is a, a modest increase in, uh, in programming and content online, audio content, and a bit of television. They're expanding the number of FM relay stations around urban centres of Papua New Guinea and the Pacific in order to give at least audiences in urban areas uh, access to, as it were, domestic quality audio broadcasting. Um, I should note the qualification though, uh, FM has a fairly small reach and FM can easily be turned off. Periodically it is turned off when governments in the region are unhappy with the, broad the foreign broadcaster or they're going through a political crisis of one sort or another. Another important and well-respected element um, of Australia's engagement through the ABC, the boosting the amount of capacity development. So, so aid in terms of technical assistance, training and partnerships with local media organisations uh, throughout the region. And quite separate from the Indo-Pacific broadcasting strategy, the government has just announced as part of um, a quad initiative with the US, Japan and India, um, they're going to invest in so-called open access radio. So that's basically boosting uh, telecommunications connections in the Pacific in order to give greater connectivity for Pacific audiences. So that's all, that's all very fine. And I should say that the team at, in the ABC at least now are working on those initiatives. They're, they're highly skilled, really very committed and enthusiastic. And I, and I should make a declaration at this point. Uh, I still sometimes do a little bit of work uh, through ABC International. And at the moment I'm under contract to work with a couple of organizations in Papua New Guinea. So just to put my hand up in terms of that, that interest. However, these things are fine when relationships are warm and conditions are sunny. But when you're trying to put together something about the so-called all the tools of statecraft, you're actually bringing together, as often as not, uh, awkward allies because, um, you know, if you look at um, the Foreign Affairs Department or other other bureaucracies, they operate under direct ministerial control. Typically, they're highly risk averse and they're always looking over their shoulders to see what the minister thinks. An organisation like the ABC, though, is uh, it's, it's quasi-government, it's a statutory authority, it has an independent charter, its business is to annoy governments from time to time and, indeed, much of its credibility as an international broadcaster over the years has been the perception that it operates at arm's, le arm's length from government and every now and then displeases government. So um, that's unfortunate for the government concerned, but also it sort of boosts the credibility. And there's a lot of research internationally to, to verify that not only in relation to Australian international broadcasting, but others uh, similarly, British, European, American, the more they're perceived to be uh, independent and not, and not uh, capture to vested interests, the more likely it is that they're going to be um, received as, as credible players. Now, in the past, the government or successive governments have been uh, had trouble in accommodating the, the different purposes and the different characters and the different uh, um, the different cultures of the various tools of statecraft. 
from the from the government point of view, back in 2014, when Julie Bishop was Foreign Minister of Australia, and at a time when the uh, the government of Prime Minister Tony Abbott all but terminated support for international broadcasting in Australia, Ms Bishop really uh, exemplified that government tendency towards message control. And, and she, she uh, was quoted as saying, there's a, an inherent conflict between the, um, the role of a broadcaster like the ABC in being an independent news organisation and one that in, in her terms was contracted to deliver government messages. Now, it's an unbelievably simplistic way of looking at things, although very much, as I say, um, an indication of the kind of uh, controlling brand management approach that governments and politicians inevitably tend to take. On the other hand, the ABC itself on occasions has proven to be really naive and, and as, as much at fault. For example, unilaterally it decided to close down remaining shortwave radio broadcasts to the Pacific. This, despite the representations of the Foreign Affairs Department, they did so for two reasons, cost, and also because shortwave is a legacy technology of the 20th century. Shortwave is a, is a, a form of broadcasting that is capable of sending signals over very long distances, thousands of kilometres, that it's difficult to jam or block. And historically, through the 20th century, was the way in which international broadcasters managed to reach audiences even where they were not wanted by uh, authorities. But regardless of shortwave itself, what was notable for me was the mindset that the ABC took in its public, um, public pronouncements. It dismissed shortwave as being central to the more propaganda-focused mode of international broadcasting favoured during the Cold War. But in the same, in the same statement, it was a, a, a submission to a government inquiry, in the same statement, it conceded that government censorship was a critical constraint to its operations. So the curiosity is, you know, what's your purpose in reaching out to foreign audiences? How can you fulfil that purpose if you actually can't reach those audiences? And if something happens to block your access to those audiences, what are you going to do about it? Now, the fact that the ABC didn't pose those questions, let alone answer them, for me was symptomatic, a loss of clarity of purpose as to the international brief and very much um, a kind of a passive posture in a way. But if, but if you broaden out from that, what we have seen is that in the post-Cold War years, so in the, in the decades after 1990, as um, as a, a prominent writer on these subjects, Monroe Price says, international broadcasting generally suffered a crisis of credibility and legitimacy. In the age of CNN, why do you need a state broadcaster, state-funded broadcaster? In the age of uh, you know, borderless trade and, and free trade, why do we need to be engaging in soft propaganda, if you like? And of course, that was at the time of, um, you know, when neoliberalism was at its peak in terms of international economic arrangements, uh, trade and domestic policies. There's a second, a second factor that was very important in throwing the, uh, the, the efficacy of international broadcasting into some degree of disrepute. This quote is from former managing director of the ABC, Brian Johns. And uh, in fact, I suspect I wrote those words 
uh, for Brian. <laughs> back, in the, back in the 1990s, we in the ABC, and at that time, um, I was uh, general manager of corporate strategy, and we were trying to um, imagine the opportunities and the constraints of the emerging digital technology. What would, what would the world look like? Where would we belong? And so on. And so it was tempting to say, well, yes, um, you know, digital can be accessed from anywhere. Um, but there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, content can be accessible from anywhere. However, it's not necessarily relevant to people outside your own domain. You know, what, why are you doing it? What's your purpose? In what sort of political and cultural context are you projecting communication and, um, and so on? So that was the general, the, the sort of fuzziness around the role of international broadcasting in those times. But of course, as we've uh, been told, um, no longer are we enjoying the so-called holiday from history that, um, that accompanied that brief period of American um, unipolarity. Um, and so we have to sort of look again and think again about purpose. So there's a reminder, uh, a reminder of political purpose. You know, back at the end of the Cold War, 1990, the Australian cabinet considered a, a major thing to do with um, with uh, international broadcasting and Radio Australia in particular. And, and it declared that the role of international broadcasting was in promoting Australia's strategic and political security. Now, other people talk about broadcasting and multi-platform broadcasting. So whether it's broadcast or online or whatever, doesn't matter, but it's there shaping the battlefield of soft power. And the battlefield of soft power gives the term soft power a somewhat sharper edge than most people give it in general conversation. And if you go back to look at the ABC legislation, the language is sort of generalised and, and, and sort of coded and the role of the ABC internationally is to build awareness and understanding of Australian attitude fundamentally its job is to influence foreign attitudes and foreign behaviour. So no longer a, a, the, the holiday from history. But let me, that leads me in to talk about the soft power stuff. Soft power has, is very often referred to everything from uh, Screen Australia in um, promoting Screen production and exports talks about it being in the business of soft power. Foreign aid agencies in the business of soft power. Years ago at a, a conference here, the Terrapin Puppet Theatre uh, got up and said they were in the business of soft power. So it's a term thrown around, but it's, um, but it's, it's, it's abstracted. It's, it's poorly used and it needs to be interrogated much more sharply. And to illustrate, to illustrate the problem, go to the, uh, so I think we've missed one. Oh, sorry. This is the next page. All right. My apologies. Um, so the advocates of soft power talk about it being the power of attraction, not of coercion. And uh, Harvard professor Joseph Nye is most associated with, with this. But, but it's difficult to harness in terms of policy because Soft power as such is highly ambiguous and circumstantial. What one culture finds attractive, another culture is repulsed by. Um, it's sort of, it, 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 as a dynamic, it's fluid, it's non-linear, 
you know, it's discursive, it's in the ether, it's hard to measure, it's easy to dismiss as power. And any use of so-called soft power to build trust and relationships takes time and can easily be disrupted. And what I think people often fail to realise, there are different forms of attraction and engagement. You know, there's, a, there's a, a form of um, so-called effective power, which is when people may like a society without making any judgments about its, uh, its, its mores, its policies, its efficacy. Um, and um, an example of that is in the Middle East where the Americans established radio stations targeting Middle Eastern youth. And they rated their socks off. An extraordinary proportion of the target audience locked into these stations because they loved the music. At the same time, attitudes towards America became worse, more hostile. You know, to like is not necessary, not necessarily to respect. Um, normative power, normative influence is when um, a society is perceived to be worthy of emulation and respect. And it's interesting that, uh, for instance, there's been some research to demonstrate that a lot of countries in Southeast Asia uh, really admire good governance. But increasingly, the examples of good governance they identify are Japan on the one hand, democracy, and Singapore on the other, an authoritarian society. So, so um, It's a different kind of attraction and engagement. And, and some others are attracted to a society pragmatically. There are still people, uh, in uh, parents in Africa, the Middle East, who are desperate to send their kids to Harvard while having highly conservative anti-Western uh, views about society. So it's... You need to look and interrogate much more robustly the nature of the power of attraction. So what does that mean in terms of um, um, international broadcasting and broadcasting that exists to represent state interests on the one hand, but also uh, the values of a social democracy like Australia? Coming back to the, to, to the broadcasting, there's a disconnect because the more that we use abstract language and avoid interrogating questions of purpose and application, the more subject we are to misunderstanding and, um, and, and conflict over the tools of statecraft. The ABC International Service declares this to be its mission statement. Now, it doesn't really say anything except in a, a kind of a branding sense. And yet, uh, a few years ago, like, well, a decade ago, the National Commission of Audit, which was used in part to justify the Abbott government's uh, decision to can international broadcasting investment, made the point that there's no clear relationship they could identify between the funding of international television and the government's foreign policy, uh, foreign policy goals. So so it's really important, I think, to dig down and be much more disciplined in identifying political purpose and the attributes of public performance that you seek to be represented. So, um, 
critical questions which are not very often asked, the purpose and circumstances from the point of view of the state. What's the, what sphere of influence are we trying to operate in? Which foreign publics at a regional level, a national level, urban versus rural? Um, what's the capacity that we're seeking to have? A, 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 a really important question at the moment when there is such insecurity and uh, such the potential for devastating conflict. Are we designing a media operation that is capable of operating only in peaceful circumstances, a la the Pacific at the moment, or in uh, circumstances of conflict? Are we designing a service that can use, for example, FM radio transmitters uh, to operate so long as they're permitted to operate, or are we wanting to have the capability of, of uh, reaching over the heads of authoritarian or unhelpful un, um, uh, authorities to reach audiences of strategic interest. Then there's the how, how, which is very much the broadcaster's domain. It's the work of the media organisation is a process, process of constant bargaining across cultures. And if you're wishing to address people or audiences at a deep level, that is to influence their attitudes and perhaps their beliefs deeply held, you've got to establish the preconditions for that. And the preconditions include establishing the sense of a shared world, a shared life world with them which is based on sort of language, the way agendas are framed, the way communication takes place so that there is a, a cultural meeting ground. Um, partly that occurs through the sort of editorial outlook you have, the editorial outlook that, that examines issues of concern really from an outside-in perspective, from the point of view of those you're trying to communicate with and not from an inside out, you know, Australian domestic oriented perspective. And the, um, the sort of credibility that gets built up is not just based on what you report or what you say. It actually is based upon who you are and how you, how you behave, the demonstration of qualities of trust, of competence and of goodwill. And style. So these things are really um, pretty, pretty uh, important. Now, what I'd like to do before rounding up, before finishing, is to actually recall the performance of Radio Australia um, in the latter years of the Cold War, because albeit in a highly flawed manner, it can be demonstrated to have performed um, a number of functions that are much more specific and much more tangible to consider than the sort of soft power, um, soft power language. Demonstrably, through its regional agendas, through its different language services, through its style, through the, the, um, the tone of, of the way it operated, it helped to frame what people thought about, how they thought about issues, not necessarily what to think, but setting agendas. Um, you can demonstrate, and, and there are case studies in the book, that it succeeded in maintaining contact with intercultural audiences, even during conditions of hostility and difficulty. For example, uh, it had massive audiences in Indonesia to the displeasure of the Suharto regime. Throughout um, the, um, throughout the, um, the controversial annexation of Timor, um, Indonesian conduct domestically, and so on. So in effect, Australia was using those broadcasts, particularly in the Indian language, Indonesian language, as part of a two-track 
foreign policy. One track was transactional, transactional diplomacy conducted on the ground. And the object of that was to, to keep meaningful contact and negotiations. And the other track was a form of ideological intervention through Radio Australia, not through, not through didactic broadcasting, but by modeling uh, the values of democracy, rule of law, and um, ostensible goodwill. And there's lots of research to demonstrate um, the effect of that. There were, um, and through that, surveys indicated that Indonesian perceptions of Australia changed. Surveys found um, Indonesian respondents were surprised that uh, in Australia, uh, Muslims could freely worship. They learned that uh, finally the white Australia policy had been uh, dismantled. They were surprised that uh, Indonesian language was taught in Australian schools and universities. They were the days. Um, so important. Also, the broadcasts by beaming in over the heads of um, government authorities challenged information cartels. You know, if you had to, so in Indonesia, the media were tightly controlled. In other parts of Southeast Asia, they were less tightly controlled. However, the, the marketplace of ideas was fairly constrained. So um, and by being able to, to reach into those audiences, you can also um, uh, demonstrate examples where it was successful in countering disinformation and misinformation. Especially in the Pacific, but not only in the Pacific, uh, the broader range of activities ranging from um, participation in regional associations, the broadcasts, the training and development assistance also uh, contributed to uh, peaceful region building. And at times it responded successfully and sometimes not so successfully to strategic contingencies, uh, cyclones destroying infrastructure on the Pacific Island state, um, citizens in distress, like uh, when Australians were taken hostage by Iraqi forces during the, uh, or in the lead up to the, the first Gulf War. So there was all of that, that's history. But uh, my proposition is that <clears throat> that past performance continues to have some contemporary relevance. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jeff. And sorry for the for the clumsy semaphore work. <laughs> I thought the semaphore worked really well. Thanks, James, for your talk. Thanks, Jeff. That was terrific and a really insightful framework for where we were, where we are now, and what we might look like in the future. So has anyone got any questions? Jeff, I don't know whether it's my memory or do I imagine, did the ABC lose its, you know, sort of overseas broadcast <laughs> to Sky News at one stage? At one stage, so it's been, as part of this yo-yoing of government policy, uh, back in the early 90s, the ABC established an international TV service, and that was at a time when uh, international broadcasters like uh, CNN were coming to the fore and we had to be in it. So that, that lasted for several years from about 1993 when the Howard government came into office in 96. It, um, it wanted to privatise. So at the same time, the Howard government announced a government review instigated very substantial, quite damaging uh, funding cuts to the ABC and um, basically forced, uh, forced the ABC to sell the network. The Seven Network purchased it, uh, ran it disastrously. <clears throat> I think it ended up being um, 
a low cost shopping channel at some point. <laughs> After several years, uh, the seven conceded they couldn't make it work and said they would hand back their license. And at that point, it coincided, I think, with the build-up of tensions in Southeast Asia. Uh, Timor was running hot. And the then Foreign Minister, Alexander Dona, um, decided that, that uh, we needed to have a, a, a louder voice in the region again. I should have said the TV service was sold off and the budget cuts to the ABC resulted in Radio Australia being halved and most of its language services being closed down. So I, I remember this time actually because the, the government then decided to, um, to put out expressions of interest for somebody to operate a new international service. The ABC was feeling really burned and um, the then managing director decided um, to, to um, not be for it because there was too much else trying to handle. Anyway, <clears throat> the bidders were not impressive. And one day, Alexander Downer was in London and he's, he was talking to a, a colleague, an ABC colleague, Philip Williams, who was correspondent in London at the time. And they got to talking about, uh, about what should happen. So Downer told Phil, Phil got in touch with another, Graham Dobell in Canberra, Dobell called me, and suddenly we were back in the business of bidding for international broadcasting. So, so then it, it, uh, we re-established um, what came to be known eventually as Australian Network, ran it for another few years um, until 2014 when the Abbott government withdrew investment. <coughs> Hi, I'm just um, interested in the type of programs. I mean, my um, experience with um, Radio Australia Shortwave is, is, is only, um, I guess, Alan McGilbray and Lindsay Hassett in the late 1960s. I just am intrigued as to what sort of programs would you um, <coughs> envisit broadcasting to achieve influence? So currently, for example, I listen to ABC Radio National for a couple of hours in the morning. And I would suggest that that was broadcast internationally, it would actually be counterproductive. Mm. So I don't think yeah. very good. So I think there should be much more emphasis on having better reporting and analysis domestically on international affairs. And if that's any good, then maybe other organisations would broadcast. Well, I think it, things change. Let me focus on the, the 1980s, which was a period of reform and change within Radio Australia. Um, carry some of the scar tissue from that. But by the late 1980s, for example, if you compared the news and current affairs agenda of Radio Australia versus Radio National, let's say, you'd see that the profile editorially was very different. Um, Radio Australia, for example, in terms of its use of foreign correspondence, uh, we use more stories from one Brussels, one correspondent in Brussels than three correspondents in London. There was a very much an Asia Pacific focus. Um, we, there was a group of um, developed uh, specialist reporters um, and the treatment of stories was different. I mean, it very much, it's not what you say, but how you say that is important in communicating across cultures. For example, uh, <clears throat> you know, back in the day, uh, one of the correspondents in Jakarta used to get very exercised about when Radio Australia used directly reports that he had written for domestic consumption. So for example, he said, um, you know, there might be uh, there might be a cholera epidemic raging through a, a village or a region in Indonesia. To an Australian audience, that's what you'd say. But the accepted, um, accepted phraseology within Indonesian society, society would have been, 
less specific that, um, you know, um, uh, an outbreak of illness or, sorry, I've just forgotten exactly, but it's, it's, it's different. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that the biggest impact of Radio Australia was through its non-English language services. So in languages like Indonesian or Chinese, for example, uh, the audience surveys found that there were between four and six times the number of people listening in those languages rather than, or uh, well, compared with, with English. It's very different. And one of the great criticisms of more recent times, I think, which is partly budget related, is it's just far too much domestic content being pumped out to, um, to um, audiences in different cultures. Um, just doesn't work. And some of it, I think, I mean, I, I was doing a job in, um, in Fiji some years ago. This is after the, the 2014 cutbacks and I decided to do the right thing. So I hunted and hunted until I could find the FM uh, frequency of Radio Australia in Suva. And I started off being appalled <laughs> and ended up staying awake all night listening to the most of it, just really appalling mishmash feed of stuff of different technical quality um, that they'd obviously just strung together to, to, to push out, just really bored. Now, the ABC is back in the game. The people who are running ABC International are really doing some terrific things, albeit on a, on a much smaller scale than you would wish. For instance, if the budget, if the money spent on, on Radio Australia in the mid-1980s were converted to current uh, value terms, then the, the budget today would be something between 65 and $66 million a year. In fact, it's about 10 to $15 million a year. So, you know, you get what you pay for. I think foreign, with foreign language broadcasts, is there any concern that the general public wouldn't know what was being broadcast? For example, BBC Persia gets criticised for actually inciting violence inside of mm. Iran. And most people aren't aware, wouldn't be aware of that. You know, yeah, well, likewise, um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the criticisms made of Radio Australia back in the day during the era of the Suharto regime was that student dissidents used to listen to Radio Australia programs, especially news and current affairs, and refer to those reports in their student newsletters, which of course were, were not welcome. Uh, so that's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a fraught thing, which is why clarity of purpose really and understanding what the utility of that potentially powerful mechanism is when you're reaching into societies unlike your own political systems unlike your own why are you doing it um, and uh, but, but a very interesting you know at a time when I, I keep um, going on about Indonesia, I do so because it seems to me it's a bit like, a, you know, fair weather, fair weather sailing. It's easy in fair weather. When shit hits the fan, it's another thing. So uh, generally speaking, an area like the Pacific is fairly calm at the moment. In the case of um, target countries like Indonesia, uh, they're often sensitive often relations are stressed. And so that's where you need to be on your game. Now, successive ambassadors to Jakarta used to complain mightily about Radio Australia. And at one, at one stage, uh, um, a managing director of the ABC uh, tried to dig into this. He said, well, why are we doing this? But uh, the foreign minister of the day, Bill Hayden, and the head of the foreign affairs department insisted that no, we want this. 
even when budgets were being cut, I've got the letter back in the, at home in the files, Foreign Affairs says, you know, if reluctantly you've got to cut services, you mustn't cut Indonesian language services. That's the only one that counts at the moment. So I come back to it, that they're playing a game, however difficult that things were on the ground, um, at, at a level of higher strategy, they were saying, what we're looking to do is to reach the Indonesian people, not just with a view to potentially influencing people today, but with a view of influencing people tomorrow. In other words, looking beyond the Suharto regime. So that's now, that's a hard edged ideological proposition. And uh, we don't often view such things as ideology in this country because we assume support for universal values, universal freedom of speech, universal human rights, which of course are not universal and are highly contested. Hmm. I think we've got time for one more question, James. Yeah, I think my question is probably more, the most relevant one. How will Radio Australia or TV Australia, how will it operate in this new environment where technology has taken over? <clears throat> So at the moment, um, the ABC international people are giving high priority to online um, stuff necessarily. Um, a lot of content is going through telephones, through mo mobile phones. Uh, they prioritise partnerships. So obviously the way to achieve penetration and reach, if you can, is to work with local counterparts and they're still using still using audio through those those transmission sets. But you know, I, I, one of the questions I have asked is, um, okay, all of this is fine, but let's look around the region. Where might you want to be having an influence? For example, Myanmar, what a disaster domestically, and what a mess you've got. Chinese influence, Bangladesh, India, all converging on the Bay of Bengal. A lot of things going very close to major shipping routes of concern to Australia. At what point, for example, would you decide we've got to be in there reaching the, uh, the, the, the Burmese people? Now, you're certainly not going to be able to set up an FM relay station there. You can provide, uh, say, satellite TV, but Increasingly, uh, governments around the world are jamming satellites, not just radio. So what do you do? Do you put content on a USB stick and uh, send it across the border to be copied by locally? Do you set up a, um, a long distance AM radio station in a friendly territory somewhere new? I don't know. The question is circumstantial, I think. The question is circumstantial. Who do you want to reach? in what circumstance, for what purpose, and what are the barriers to entry? I think you've... But you're right, in, but as a general statement, clearly things today and in the future will not be as they were in terms of the... You know. I was thinking of from the individual, because if you look at the young people, I mean, the country keep mentioning uh, Indonesia. Yeah. The vast majority of the young people there, they get the news from either things like Facebook or TikTok videos. Yep. In other words, ABC must be able to produce a news item that lasts for 15 to 20 seconds. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, is, is ABC capable of that challenge? Well, they're doing it. Uh, to, to what extent, I, I'm not in a position to, to say. But, but I come back, I mean, just recently, I was reading that uh, Finland um, is, uh, has got a gaming a game or games that apparently are used widely by young people across the border in Russia. So I gather that Finland has begun embedding messages within the game to reach to reach people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's circumstantial. What are the barriers to entry? And uh, you know, choose your weapon. Jeff, thanks so much. Let's give me some place for the last answer in terms of a gaming grandchild. Um, 
but I think that what you've done is give us a view of some of the good things of the past, some of the challenges of the past, but also that there's a, like Alan Gingell said, a complex world and a complex way forward. And I think that's been really impressive. Just for people's advice, um, you talked about Myanmar. Um, we have Sean Turnell likely to be giving the um, Pimsel lecture this year, which will be fantastic. People will remember that Sean was um, incarcerated in um, Myanmar for more than 12 months. So that would be, I think, really um, enlightening. And secondly, but closer to home, we've got um, Will Hodgman, former Premier and former um, uh, High Commissioner of Singapore, talking at our next meeting on the 20th of June. James is hopefully going to be sending out um, <coughs> invitations to that this week. So um, that should be good. That's going to be at the Royal Yacht Club. So sort of slightly more um, upmarket, but no more important in depth than what Jeff's talked tonight. So thanks, Jeff. Thank you.